graphic on the front of it. We're looking today at a subject that we must look at because of the day in which we live. God made us male and female. And so the question I ask in the light, is sexual identity or is gender identity based on God's providence or our preference? Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19, if you would, please. If you don't have your Bible, we have the text printed on the screen for you, but would very, very much like to give you a Bible so you can read for yourself, have a copy of God's Word, which is very critical. If you found Matthew 19, 1 to 6, and would stand with me, I would appreciate that as I, as I read this text. You follow along as I read. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. This is what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. It's the final word on any issue. May the Lord help us to increasingly develop convictions, biblical convictions about the authority of Scripture and the direction we're given. But at the same time, may it be a convictional compassion, because that's what's needed today to meet the needs of our world. Thank you. Please be seated. Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, there is a sexual tsunami headed toward this country of ours. Its waves are gathering strength and are approaching from the west coast, the east coast, the southern coast, and even our northern borders. In many instances, church as we have known it will be swept away in a social tidal upheaval that will leave nothing but moral devastation in its wake. However, there is a place that we can flee to if we want to withstand the sweeping waves. That place is the solid rock, which we've sung about, where by faith we will stand when all other ground is sinking sand. These, the warning waves have been crashing on the shore for some time. Several decades. The virtual elimination of, of prayer and the removal of the Ten Commandments from the arena of public education and from the public arena altogether. The church in the South standing on the wrong side of the civil rights movement when we could have been the beacon to lead the way. Roe versus Wade and abortion on demand. These waves have been crashing crashing, warning that something needs to change, that the church needs to bring the gospel, the light of the gospel, with more brilliance and more obviousness in a darkening culture. And now within the next two weeks, the Supreme Court will announce its decision on the question of whether same-sex marriage will be declared a constitutionally protected union and the law of the land. When you study the social shifts that have taken place in this country, particularly in the last 60 years or so, though they are very different movements, they have one common thread. And it's the sentiment that's expressed in Psalm 2, 
And we're told about the nations and the heathen who rage when they say, we will not have this God rule over us. This is the brave new world in which we live. But I would submit that perhaps the final assault or the most obvious assault on the authority of God to be God is the celebration of gender reassignment highlighted by the transition of Bruce Jenner, the, the Olympic decathlon gold medalist, his transition to Caitlyn Jenner. The official term for this, and, and you need to know this term, I want you to, want you to write it down, is gender dysphoria. Now, you know the word euphoria. Euphoria is a, is a good feeling. Euphoric. Dysphoria is a bad feeling. Gender dysphoria is the, is the discontentment with one's gender that God assigned at conception. It expresses itself primarily in a very small percentage, usually of men, who will say things like, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. It also manifests itself sometimes in women who will say just the opposite, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. And they will, they will deal with that in different ways. In the past, therapy and medications were given to help people cope with who they are genetically, what their DNA says about their sex, whether they're male or female. But that has given way to transgender counseling. In fact, if you've kept up with the, with the Bruce Jenner to Caitlyn Jenner matter, you know when he came out of surgery, the reassignment surgery to to help further his desire to become woman-like. When he came out of surgery and became awake, one of the things he said was, in a panic, what have I done? And there was rushed to his side gender counselors, transgender counselors, who would help him to begin to cope with what he had done. And he's being celebrated with pictures on magazine covers and interviews. And but statistics tell us that his celebration will be short-lived. Studies in Sweden, and Sweden is a much more liberal nation, has been at least than us. They're way ahead of us in the moral collapse. Studies have shown that 15 to 15 years out after transgender procedures, after a, a man with DNA chromosomes transitions to be a feminized man, that suicide happens at an alarming rate, 20 times more than the average. The reason I want you to learn the term gender dysphoria is because the word dysphoria is the key. It is the, it is the place to go where we, where we have answers that no one outside of Christ has. It is the age-old discontentment. And all of us struggle with discontentment about some things. We struggle sometimes about those. There is a better way. We, uh, we have the answer. And the picture of fleeing to the, to the rock that is higher than I am, to the safety place as the tsunami approaches, I want you to get it right in your minds. It's not a picture of us hiding. It's a picture of us getting on solid footing so we can extend a hand 
a hand of convictional compassion to people who have lost their way, who struggle not knowing what the best solutions are. Because you see, you can have hormonal injections, you can have gender reassignment surgery, but a man biologically, according to DNA and chromosomes, is still a man, even when he wants to look like a woman. And a woman is still a woman, even when she wants to go through all those things to take on manly characteristics. In fact, you could say that the best you have is a feminized man. It's very interesting in our men's fraternity study that Robert Lewis talks about the soft male. The feminized man. Or the masculinized woman. That's what we need to know today is whatever you understand or don't understand about this, this, this trend that is now being celebrated and, and, and folks will be, will be forced right into our faces just like same-sex marriage, just like abortion, just like just it's going to be pushed into the face of, of the church of Jesus Christ. And we need to be ready to respond. And our response should not be pushed back. In fact, I would submit to you that that kind of response is what's led to the mess we're in today. So I want us to think for a few minutes this morning on what the Bible has to say on this matter. We'll consider two things under that, the horror of sin and the hope of the gospel. Then the second thing I want us to see is what the church should, should be and do in speaking to this matter. First of all, does the Bible say anything about this? Well, yes, the Bible speaks about the horror of sin. And whether the, whether the culture calls the transgender or the gender dysphoria issue, whether they call it transsexualism or transgenderism or gender identity disorder, or gender dysphoria, this desire to change one's sex or to fulfill the role of the opposite gender, whether you call them transsexuals or transgenders, the scripture makes some things plain. You've got to go back to our text in Matthew 19. The Pharisees came to Jesus to test him, to trick him. Is it lawful to get a divorce for any reason? <laughs> Who was teaching that in that day? Nobody was teaching that. But that's the question. And Jesus moves right through their trap and basically says, until you understand the implications and the application of, of the creative power of God, none of these other things will make sense to you and you'll be making them up as you go. Jesus does not say in this passage, well now, let's consider the causes for divorce, grounds for divorce. Have you not read that in the beginning God made them male and female? In the wisdom of God, two sexes would very best demonstrate his glory and his goodness. In fact, you remember in Genesis when, when he created male and female, having said throughout the whole week of creation, it is good, it is good, it is good. When he came to create male and female, he said, it is very good. The study that our ladies are, are going through, the first thing they tackled was gender matters. When Jesus says this to the Pharisees, in Matthew 19, he is quoting Genesis 1.27, the very creative activity of God. Parenthetically, let me say, this is why we've been saying this for years, sending out a warning for years that it's absolutely essential that you embrace Genesis 1 through 11 as history. Because if it's history, then an argument must be made as to why we would move away from history, why we would change historical reality. If it's myth, if it's just a legend told, or as Miley Cyrus said recently, the fairy tales of the Old Testament, 
then you don't have to factor it in when you're talking about any social issue. But Jesus teaches us here that Genesis 1.27 is key and critical to understanding the nature of relationships and the well-being of a society. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. There's some fascinating things happening in the cultural arena. In the past, if you keep up with these sort of things, you know that you hear about LGBT, lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, LG, LGBT. But the letters have, have swelled. It's now LGBTQQIAAP. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, in, intersex, asexual, allies, and pansexual. And it will continue to swell. And we must wade into this arena, not run from it. Wade into it and say, male and female are the two sexes that the all-wise God determined would be the expression of his creative power. In Psalm 139, the psalmist speaking in verses 13 to 16 says, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Genesis 19, 1 to 7 tells us about the episode at, at Sodom. And if you've kept up, if you read on the whole discussion, the now so-called evangelical Christian pro-homosexual group, Tony Campolo came out this week saying the church must embrace same-sex marriage like it embraces heterosexual marriage. The former editor of Christianity Today came out and said the same thing. As this is all happening, we must faithfully and fiercely say no, we were knitted together in our mother's womb by our God. He, God the Creator gave us our DNA, and He does not make a mistake when He assigns DNA to a growing unborn baby. And in Jude 7, when you read the summary, what, what they're talking about, about what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, because what I started to say was if you're reading uh, on these issues today, you'll know that people are explain, trying to explain that that Genesis 19, 1 to 7 about Sodom and Gomorrah was not about the homosexuality there. It was about other things, greed. Listen to Jude's explanation in verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. According to Jude in the New Testament, the punishment to Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain was their sexual immorality expressed in unnatural desire. Romans 1, 18 to 32, I only have time to read it to you today, but it is, you need to study this passage because in this passage is an explanation of what the wrath of God looks like when it comes upon a society. Verse 18 says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Those, that's two summaries, the two-word summary for the Ten Commandments. Ungodliness is our relationship to God. Unrighteousness is our relationship to one another. Of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, they try to hold down the truth, cover the truth, do away with the truth. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them, his individual attributes, invisible attributes. His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God nor give thanks to Him. This is the, this is the battleground today. All these different uh, manifestations of moral decay come together under one theme. We will not have this God rule over us. 
They became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. This is the wisdom of the world. In Virginia, in one of the school systems there, I believe it's in Fairfax, the administration has brought in counselors to teach their teachers that you do not tell a boy he is a boy and do not tell a girl she is a girl. You've got to find another language for that because, because we're not going to imprint them or tattoo them with a certain identity. They need to discover that on their own. Decide what they are. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, here it is, God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. We read that and we typically think, well, that's, that's the unnatural intimacy of a man and a man, a woman and a woman. I think you can take into this as well a man who wants to change so that he looks like a woman, dishonoring their bodies. They exchanged the truth, verse 25, about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. The celebration, the courage, we're told, of a Bruce Jenner to do what he did. Twenty-six. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. The women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. Men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men, perceiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see it fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Brothers and sisters, that describes a whole lot more than the transgender community. And though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So they will say things like, I know that you think what I'm doing is wrong, but you see, the Old Testament law tells us something very important that we need to hear. And our ladies are learning about this in their study on Thursdays. I'll give you just one quote. When God created male and female, he had the dynamic of his own relationship in mind. The Lord created the two sexes to reflect something about God. He patterned the male-female relationship, them, after the us-our relationship that exists within God. This, is, this was a statement. He designed the two sexes to put God on display. And anything that comes against that is contrary to the will of God and will have consequences attached to it. Deuteronomy 22.5 in the law. A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. I read that this week, and the Lord brought, brought back to my mind, when I was growing up, one of the things that was kind of popular for fellowships and church gatherings was the womanless wedding. We would laugh and cut up and make jokes, and everybody had a great time, and then you realize, what was the church doing to itself? When the scripture is clear that you don't Woman shall not dress like a man, nor shall a man dress like a woman. And we do that and we laugh and then we become appalled when someone says, I want to do that all the time. What you enjoyed for your fellowship for an hour or so, I want to do all the time. 
brothers and sisters, there's a sense in which when you study this matter, you realize we, we have done this to ourselves. We've made light of things that God takes seriously. And so it's a short leap from the prohibition, don't dress like a man if you're a woman, don't dress like a woman if you're a man, to 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 where God is chiding the Corinthians when he says, do you not know that the unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. And the term there speaks of, a, of an effeminate man. The effeminized man, if you please. This has come now to our doorstep, and it's coming with a vengeance. Because I told you last week when we were studying that we don't want to be Pharisees, that the pharisaical response to these kinds of things is, is, doesn't deter them. It feeds them. It provokes them. We could look at a lot more Scripture because there's a lot more that can be said about the Bible's prohibitions on this whole gender bender idea. In fact, if you haven't heard about it yet, you will in some schools that even the, even the elementary, mid-high, senior high schools around the country, some of them are having gender bender days where, where they've, the boys come dressed as girls and the girls come dressed as boys. And it would, you would want to curl up into a corner and pull a blanket over you except for the hope of the gospel. Yes, there's the horror of sin, but there's the hope of the gospel. Because that passage I just read in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 where he says, here's who will not inherit the kingdom. He goes on to say in verse 11, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And that's the key. Were. You see, I doubt there's anybody sitting here today who, who was transgendered and then was saved by grace and began to try to make part of the journey back that you can make back from that. But brothers and sisters, we, you could fill in some struggles we had and say that's who we were we were this we were that and realize that the gospel saved us well what must the church be and do I think first of all we've got to learn biblical contentment and model it to our children our children need to see in our men what it means to be a man David, David was a man a man's man the apostles that blazed the trail taking a, a message that was considered heretical by Jews and, and, and heretical by Romans and Greeks, they took the word nonetheless with boldness as, as men. You don't get the sense reading Paul or Peter or Matthew or John or Luke or hearing about these people, Timothy and, and Titus and Tychicus, you don't get the feeling that these were, that these were feminized males. These were men who according to the definition of men's fraternity, who reject passivity, who accept responsibility, who lead courageously, and are not living primarily for now, but are expecting a greater reward, expecting the reward of God for a life lived in the body and the mind that God gave us, renewed by the Spirit. That's, that's what manhood is. Womanhood is, is Proverbs 31. She doesn't sew making men's clothes for herself. She sews to cover her children. She, she cares for her household. Real womanhood. We need to learn in our lives biblical contentment and model it to our children. Because you see, dysphoria is contentment. And if they see us living lives of discontentment, then for them the gospel doesn't satisfy the deepest needs. But if we can live before our, our children, our grandchildren, as people who have joy in Christ, that Jesus Christ 
as I said earlier, more than all I need in him, I find. When they see the power of the gospel in our lives, we must learn contentment. Paul had to learn it. We do too. How do we speak to a generation that is facing ultimate discontentment and takes steps that are considered drastic by us when they see us discontent and simply not taking, not willing to take the steps they're willing to take? Secondly, and quickly, we need to develop convictional compassion toward those who struggle with their identity. Because see, the truth of the matter is, you'll never find your identity outside of Jesus Christ. You may not go to the lengths of, of, of transitioning in a transgender surgery and hormone treatment, but you don't find your identity outside of Christ. And we live in a day when all the moral boundaries are falling down, all the, the hedges built in by the Ten Commandments have been blown away, and people can sway so far off. We must demonstrate that we're absolutely committed to the creative power of God. As the psalmist says, he made us. We didn't make ourselves. And he's willing to remake us, make us over in the image of Jesus Christ by grace through faith. But it is, it is rebellion, perhaps the highest form of rebellion, to resent being male and want to be female, resent being female and want to be male. And we don't say that looking down our noses at these folks. We ought to say that with compassion. Say on the one hand that you cannot change your DNA. At the same time, reach out to sinners as sinners. Don't expect them to jump through our hoops. We must love and not judge or joke. We've made jokes of these things. We've made light of them. And our weightless approach to these things with levity rather than urgency has given us this trial, this tragedy. We must love and not joke. We must listen and not lecture. If you encounter somebody in your family or a friend or a neighbor or a co-worker who is, who is transgendering, who is transitioning to that, the last thing they need is our lectures. What they need is our love to show them a better way, to bear with them and lovingly keep pointing them to, to the one who alone can give satisfaction, the one who alone can give contentment, the one who alone can give meaning to life and joy and peace. When you read that the suicide rate is 20 times that of the average, we must offer life and a reason to live. I could say a lot more. There's a whole lot of material, and I'd be glad if you want to. If you want to ask me, I'll send you the articles and the links and some stuff that I was reading through. We've got to be sensitive to the fact that yes, some people are born with with congenital abnormalities associated to their gender. Thank God we live in a day when, with all the tests and analyses that can be conducted, that that can be addressed. All you do is you match what their DNA is, and then you go to work to help them physically manifest that. That's a far cry though. It's a far cry from trying to change who God made you to be. Such were some of us, such were some of you. There's a sexual tsunami coming. When the waves crash, they're going to be devastating. And if you and I are not going to get swept away in the tidal wave of moral collapse, then we must stand on the rock with arms stretched out to grab hold of any who we could rescue them. 
introduce them to the solid foundation and footing of Jesus Christ. I want you to watch a video. Folks, today's coming. And we're going to deal with this up close and personal. Watch this video and grieve and then hope. You look at me now, I'm back to being who God wanted me to be as a man. I I've been, I've been reading my Bible, Bible every day, and all, and all I could hear, hear was God, God saying, well, well, you really need, need to go back to being who I made you, and, and your, story your story is great, but just, but just don't, don't do it as a girl, girl because, because you're, you're not a girl. girl. And, I and I know that. It, it just, just tears, tears me up to think that, 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 that I did all this, and I was a phony, I was a fraud, but I tried pulling it off, and people... People, People just call, call me, me ma'am, and, and, and she, she, and her, and, you know, you know I have my long hair. hair. I, don't, I, don't I didn't wear much makeup. makeup. As you can see, I got lip liner, liner and the eyebrows, eyebrows tattooed, tattooed, which, which now, now I got to live this way. way. But it's but a great, it's a great testimony. testimony, and, and uh, uh, I just want to try to help someone else before they, before they make the same mistake I did. Everybody, Everybody I told I was getting a sex change and blah, blah, blah. They all said, oh, if that's what, if that's if that's what you think is right, then go ahead and do it. You know, you know, if, 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 if you feel, feel good about it, you know, you know that's, what, that's you what you want, go, go, go do it. it. And uh, how, how can, can that happen when you're supposed, when you're supposed to, be to be accountable for your brothers and sisters and help them out, according to what I read? And they didn't do it. They did not do it. And to this day, they thought I was going to be a disgrace to them. That's, that's, that's why, why they, they didn't do anything. anything. They, just they just told me, told me that, that there's, there's the door. The door. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. You know. But I always, but I always thought, thought I needed to be important. important. And, that, and that's, that's another, another reason. All the tattoos and the, the, the piercings. I thought, uh, oh, I'm going oh, to be somebody someday. someday. Uh, I, I want to be famous. famous you know? You know? But, now, but now, I do, do want to be famous. But I want to be famous for God. And I want to take everybody down the path that needs help. Please listen to this because... Without, Without the Lord, the Lord you'll, have nothing. Nothing. you'll have nothing. You'll have nothing. You know, you know, he's, he's the he's the vine, and we're the branches, and you know, we, can we can do nothing without Him. Without him. But, the but the whole thing, thing is, why most, most people will not, will not go to any of these things because, because it's, all it's all about the embarrassment. The embarrassment. You are so, you are so embarrassed, embarrassed what, what you've been doing, doing that, you that you can't tell anybody that. that. And that's what I kept a secret for all those years. I couldn't tell nobody. I was too embarrassed. But you have to stop. You have to stop and and get help because... You're going, you're going to destroy your life, you're going to destroy, destroy the life of your, of your, of your friends, friends, your spouse, spouse your, whoever, whoever it, may it may be, because, because this, is, this the is the worst thing that I think that, I think that, 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 that anybody can do, can do is, is, is get, get involved in the, in the sex uh, industry, industry or, or business, business or, or whatever. Or whatever. It, it destroyed me, me. But praise, praise God, God. Uh, I'm set free now, and I'm happy as can be. I am so happy and overjoyed, you know, because my life now... It's like, it's like over the, over top. the top. I have, I have nothing, nothing, but I have, but I have everything. everything. If that, if makes, that sense. makes sense. I have, I have Jesus. The question we have to ask is would he be welcome here? Would he be welcome here? You see, if he's not, the tsunami will sweep us away. If he is, then we can be a beacon and a lighthouse and offer hope. Know the word. Be convictional about it. But in communicating that to people like this person who went the whole way and then met Jesus and now is trying to make his way back. Compassion. Folks that are struggling with this, compassion. You see, what he honestly admitted was that's where everybody who transgenders ends up. And we pray to God we can get to them within that 15 to 20 year window when they decide the only answer is to take their own life. God has raised you and me up for such a time as this. May he find us faithful. Modeling for our children the best of the two sexes God created. Reaching out to those 
who have lost their way on this matter. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we, we lack the wisdom we need to deal lovingly in a culture that hates what we stand for, that sees our convictions as barriers. And dear God, we need wisdom to hold to our convictions because they are true. And then learn to listen because this fellow and many like him were hurting deep down inside. And they went for superficial, traumatic answers. And we know that only Jesus Christ can fill the empty heart. So help us to love as Jesus loved. Help us to reach out to the gender dysphoria folks, the transgender community, and point a more excellent way, the way of love, love that leads to life in Christ, a life fulfilled. Help us to manifest that. And we pray that you'll let us see the day when, when many are saved and we can say such were such were some of you we ask this in Jesus name Amen let's stand together